uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where to start. You know, it's, I mean, it really, it, it, in order to to look at what's going on, you really have to go back and, and have context. You know, that's the problem in this country. We have something and we react, and it's we just don't understand. It's got all this, you know, root to it, right? And, and context, and so it's not easily answered without looking at what's going on, and just is sort of like a, a fast thing is that it's not just the border right now the border is the issue but and has been the issue for a long time but we need to look at how we've gotten to this situation not only with militarization but 11 million undocumented people here which is why the reason we quote need you know militarization at the border and such so we, in other words I guess we have to go back to the history of immigration to in this area in particular. I mean, you know, history of immigration is something that should be learned by everybody, and that's one of the problems in this country. We tout ourselves as a nation of immigrants, and no one knows anything about the history of immigration. Mm -hmm. That's the real problem. It's the root of the problem of militarization and all of the human rights abuse we have is that people have absolutely no idea. So when people say, you know, um, we should have a messaging workshop, you know, because they have what don't you get about illegal. And while messaging is critical, because I believe in messaging that doesn't harm anybody else. I mean, that's a huge topic. I believe in it. The way it's handled, it's really wrong. People say, well, you know, they have what don't you get about illegal. You know, well, you know, we have we are human, you know, and it doesn't catch or, you know, halt the deaths, no more deaths. And it's not because they're not catchy. It's because it needs to resonate. It has to have some kind of ability to, to connect with the public. And the public is so ignorant. The American public is so ignorant about immigration history in this country. It's unbelievable. We are not taught the history of immigration, which then, you know, we don't have time to go into all of that, but we need to talk about Mexican immigration, right? I mean, the border was violently imposed, um, United States, you know, uh, took over half of Mexico's land in an act of war. I mean, we have all of that background manifest destiny, what happened in the gold rush. I mean, all of this stuff is in, has to be taken into context, especially when we think that all of this was Mexico at one time, that needs to be known. Most people don't even know that, okay? So we start from there, but in terms of the current immigration situation, you know, why we have 11 million people here, I mean, we have to understand that we, as a country, as a government, as a government, began to encourage unauthorized, the two key words, encouraged and unauthorized migration from Mexicanos to the United States to build the U.S. I mean, most people have no clue. They say, oh, why are 11 million people here? Which is a really good question. The problem is then they listen to the, you know, Fox TV or even and ABC mm -hmm. that it's, and even our side of, so, oh, well, you know, we have what people here because um, they're poor, sure. the countries can't, you know, uh, provide for them, uh, their violent governments, um, all of the things which are have some grain of truth, but the real reality is hidden by all of that, right? The reality is that we have 11 million people here because we've asked them to be here, because our economy has always depended on them and depends on them today. Does the American public know that? Absolutely not. So that's why, that's what frames the policy on migration and the border in particularly, and that's why it's fundamentally flawed, fundamentally flawed. And so uh, in the early 1900s, uh, you know, we treated the Chinese immigrants really terribly. We had uh, a head, uh, an exclusion act, and then we had this head tax. It was really the Chinese head tax, but it was a head tax that was imposed on any uh, industrialist you know, employer guy who wanted to bring in foreign workers. They had to pay a head tax. And after what we did to the Chinese, uh, there was this question of who's going to create the, who's going to build the United States. And they actually 
created a commission, the Dillingham Commission, 1911, to decide what? Who's going to build the United States? The West. Who's going to do it? It was the Dillingham Commission. And then they went to the Department of Treasury in 1916. In 1916, they went, the industrialists went to the Department of Treasury and got the departmental order of 1916, which said Mexicans are excluded from having them to have to pay the head tax. And I bring that one out because that's just the first of the measures of the United States. Policy-wise, enters into this policy to say, let's encourage, let's invite Mexicanos to come in. And obviously it was an, an easy answer, right? Who are we going to have? Well, you turn south. Um, they pretty much studied them, you know, Mexicanos in a terrible way. I don't know if you've ever seen fast forward to you know 42 and seen the, the photographs of braceros that are all naked in a room and they're sprayed and looked at and prodded and to see if they could come in as workers so that's what they did in 1911 so uh, it, so initially they were a, a, a you know a, a treasury issue right a tax issue um, that creation of wealth it was under Department of Treasury then we were moved under Department of Labor we were a labor issue and then moved under Department of Justice um, for the the major piece uh, of um, the immigration uh, statute that continues to this day I think uh, created in 52 if I'm not mistaken um, you know begins the whole uh, treatment of immigrants under Department of Justice and then the worst thing that ever happened was in April of 2003, we were placed under Department of Homeland Security. So it really, uh, if you look at just that development, it shows you where we've been and now how immigrants are looked at as a potential threat to national security. That's where we are now and since 2003. So in the meantime, we continue to invite immigrants here. And then when we had economic recession, same ignorant public, who do we blame? The immigrant, right? Because the American workers start saying, you know, I'm losing my job. I mean, during the Depression, all the times, I'm losing my job. I'm losing my house. No health care. My kids' school is cl are closing down. I mean, up, you know, up to now, same thing. And people have a right to have economic insecurity, and they have good questions. The problem is they already believe all the myths and lies and racist information that has been put forward, right? I mean, I went to a school here. I'm, we have six generations here on my mother's side. Um, when I was in school, I recall a paragraph about us, right? Oh, there was a war, the Mexican-American War, and there was a treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and voila, and that's it. So, I mean, if that's the kind of information we're getting, it's no wonder that we have these horrific policies that are based on lies. And so the truth of the matter is that the border's always been open. Always been open. Of course, they created the crime of illegal entry in 1926, I believe, when they created the Border Patrol um, and they fashioned themselves after the Texas Rangers who were really brutal back then, killing Mexicans. And I mean, it was really brutal. And uh, they created the crime of illegal entry. And there we have it, right? So we want you, and when we prob things are bad, it's like, you're a criminal. You cross the border illegally. What we don't understand is that Mexicanos have followed the rules. They truly have followed the rules. We're a capitalist society. We're so proud of being this capitalist society. You know, more than ever, I mean, the markets, and you, you saw the last presidential debate on you know, how proud we are to be a capitalist society and yet we don't get the very basic thing with capitalism, which is supply and demand, you know, not in terms of migration, right? We criminalize it. Well, let's face it, the two biggest addictions we have in this country are drugs and cheap labor. And isn't it interesting that we criminalize both of them? And so we have to examine why we criminalize both of them, right? We criminalize both of them to control as well as to make money for those in the one to two percent, right? It's always been about that. And, and that's sort of bringing it fast forward to, to now because remember, we've seen 
these trade policies happening for a long, long time. I mean, in the 50s and the 60s through the 70s, we're talking about major investment in Latin America, major investment in Mexico. What does investment really mean there? You can look at the studies. It's taking out billions in profits for millions in investments or you know and leaving very little for infrastructure in the country so that started long ago and so all of it even free trade has its own context it didn't just happen oh 1994 we signed the free trade agreement and voila we have this no this had already been ongoing and they began to you know clearing out you know the whole globalization has taken some time uh you know they we have um uh, part of the University of Arizona here, the law school, has the North American Free Trade Center. I mean, they were critical in beginning to figure out legally and policy-wise how we were going to begin to penetrate um, uh, those societies and how we can make it easy for capitals to, uh, capital goods to be, you know, brought in through and, and uh, uh, through the borders and all. So all of it has its context, and and you can see that once we get to the, you know, 80s and and we have Ronald Reagan talking about, um, you know, making a big speech, it was the critical speech where we began to see really a focus on militarizing the border. It wasn't Clinton, even though it was Clinton who actually did it in 94, but it was before that when Reagan gave in his speech something about that no country can remain sovereign without control of its borders. I forgot. I have the exact quote here somewhere, um, but beginning with Reagan there, we begin to see now a, a sort of a military kind of control, uh, you know, outlook in terms of the entire border. We really begin to see it then. You can, <clears throat> at that time, Lupe and I would, you know, talk about the militarization of the border. We were lone voices out there and we were young and everybody just said oh yeah they're they're hysterical militarization it's like they laughed at us now everybody knows it's true right but but back then they were making fun we i just ran into the leaflet we had a forum in 1991 the free trade agreement an analysis and implication to our community we had that in 1991 we had colby who was mr free trade and has continued to profit off of being Mr. Free Trade for the United States. You know, he was the main representative. We had him here at a forum together with um, some Mexican senators and congressmen that came in. And our analysis, of course, back then was it was going to be bad. It would be bad for U.S. workers and bad for Mexican workers in particular, right? Um, in 94, I have it on tape. I had a national it wasn't a debate, but it was a morning show with Paula Zahn, CBS This Morning or something. And I drove up to Phoenix, and it was McCain and myself, and we had the first 14 deaths. Not the first 14 deaths, because we had had deaths of the Central Americans, and we were involved with that, too. You know, I mean, uh, sanctuary was declared after we had been working. We, as the Mexican community, had been working through Manzo. And we had been working with the Central American refugees beginning in 1980 when a woman came in with a bullet lodged in her rib cage. The other day, Lupe said it was lodged somewhere else, but I remember it was in her rib cage. And we began, you know, uh, talking about the, the war in El Salvador and, and then event, and we uh, got a lot of churches to give us property as collateral to bond out hundreds of Central Americans in El Centro. And eventually the churches came around to, to see that the hearings for political asylum were a sham. I mean, they weren't about, the United States was not about to um, give political asylum, acknowledge that those people were being politically persecuted when it was us who was funding all of that war, right? So, I mean, and that's always happened. The State Department at that time, if a Chinese tennis player or Cuban said, you know, came to a game, oh, I want asylum. I mean, the cameras were everywhere. You wouldn't believe it. Oh, they're seeking political asylum. And yet any country that was pushing its people out because of policies related to the United States, of course, it didn't exist, right? And so El Centro is, is one of the, the biggest examples, but it, it continues today, right? We uh, implemented the North American Free Trade Agreement, 
Um, and those are really historic uh, changes to our global structure when you think about it. I mean, when you create these trade agreements, it, it um, supersedes nation states. I mean, right after NAFTA, it wasn't too many years after that Mexico had, they were in some conference in Monterrey, and the top officials of Mexico were saying, you know, we didn't anticipate this mass migration because look at the United Nations several years ago said, we've documented over six million Mexicanos that had a job related to agriculture that have fled because they've been wiped out because of NAFTA and have crossed into the United States unlawfully, right? So it's over six million. Uh, and agriculture is big in Mexico. They're much more agricultural than we are. I mean, and most of the people in the United States don't understand that either, that it's a highly agricultural country, or was. In 1994, Mexico still fed its people poorly, but always had beans and tortillas. It didn't matter. You had a hedo system, I mean, you had a system where people were still fed, and Mexico exported corn, beans, soybeans, you know, a, a variety of products. You come forward and what does Mexico do? Imports. Imports even corn into, the, into Mexico from the United States. So, I mean, that tells you a lot, and that the six million, how can people complain that, you know, the illegals are here when it's our policies that were implemented that have caused people to cross. So I always tell people, if you don't want people to cross, why don't you join us then in creating a situation where we address the root cause? Because I'll tell you what, it's the number one problem in our Congress because even our friends will not talk about root cause. I mean, once in a while you'll get somebody to just make a... But in the Congress and the Senate, you can forget it. We've barely gotten our immigrant rights friendly organizations to say, okay, we have to talk about root cause because nobody wants to talk about it. It's the big invisible, you know, pink elephant in the room that nobody wants to acknowledge is there. And that is that, we, you know, migration is not a military or a law enforcement issue. It, uh, especially with Mexico, it never has been. It's a lie. It's always been an economic social, families want to reunite, political phenomenon. Political, well, El Salvador, the biggest example. NAFTA, another example. And now our drug war, another example of U.S. policy imposed in other countries that causes mass displacement of people that come into the United States and nobody knows and nobody says. You know, there's a lot of good people, good organizations that are promoting immigration reform but refuse to acknowledge it. And until we deal with that and accept it, we can't solve migration issues because migration is a social, political, economic phenomenon. It is not a law enforcement issue. It is not a national security issue, you know, because what we've done is we have created incredible fear. I mean, look at, let me go back to NAFTA. At the time when they imposed NAFTA and they, oh, I debated McCain at this thing. When we talked about the deaths and I said something about NAFTA and this was only one year after, this was 94, so it must have been 93. She asked me about NAFTA and I said, NAFTA has been good for the 24 new billionaires that have been created in Mexico. Carlos Slim was already the only one. And we created 24 new billionaires. And McCain just lashed out at me. I still have it in tape. And here I am, I'm a nobody. And here he is, a U.S. senator, could have been president. I mean, I, I, it's, it's unbelievable to me that they can be that stupid or that ignorant or that cynical and lying. I mean... You know, he lashed out at me and said, that's not true. NAFTA's already cre created, you know, 25,000 new jobs, blah, 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 blah. You know, what does he say now? And does the American public even ask him, hey, McCain and Colby, you campaigned and you said that we should support NAFTA because it was going to solve the migration issues. Why were they building walls at the very same time that they were promoting NAFTA? That's what we were also saying. Wait a minute. If NAFTA's going to 
solve the migration issues, why would they have to build walls? Especially between two countries that had good neighbor policy, you know? And um, because they knew. Because they knew that mass migration would in fact occur. And let's face it, you know, uh, technology has changed everything. So new world, I mean, where you can literally pick up means of production from here to elsewhere in the world, that changed everything. And we knew that there would be mass migration because of that. And look at what's going on. We had maquiladoras, like I said, everything builds up, right? We had maquiladoras. We don't have that many maquiladoras because we've made the whole country maquiladora. That's what we basically want. And we want the country basically to be just gatekeepers. Operation gatekeeper, hold the line, uh, uh, hold the line there in Rio Grande and for us safeguard, right? That was begun under Clinton. You know, Clinton began uh, this deadly border policy. Um, uh, adopted from Silvester Reyes, who was later congressman, and thank goodness he was just defeated, but he was the first Hispanic um, Border Patrol sector chief, and right where we were making some headway over some violations, uh, we were working in a, in a cross-border network, uh, Immigration Law Enforcement Monitoring Project, it was part of the AFSC, and we were part of that, and we had actually, Esteban Torres, um, uh, had submitted a bill to create an Immigration Enforcement Oversight Committee. And we were gaining headway and then boom, Silvestre Reyes announced and all the compliant media came and announced, we are going to do the hold the line. It was actually blockade first, but we changed the name, you know, blockade sounds real rough. And we don't like it in the United States to have anything that that is accurate or sounds too rough. So instead of Operation Blockade, they, charged, they named it Operation Hold the Line because he said, I will put agents and they can hold the line and we will do that. And it was really terrible because that began between he and Johnny Williams, who was the uh, Western Region Border Patrol guy, uh, they came up with his deadly policy, both of them. They're the ones who are responsible. And then he went on to be a congressman and he continued to build the border. I mean, he was the head of, under the Democrats, he was the chair of the, um, oh my God, the Intelligence Committee and such. He got lots of money from, you know, all the people who have profited off the border. In fact, they created this uh, CONDEF consortium of nine universities, of which the, United, the, UA, the U of A is one of them too, who received millions and millions of dollars to begin to study how to control the border. We have our own Border Patrol Securities Initiative Test Center here at the U of A, as you probably know. Uh, professor Nunnemacher, famous professor, uh, has come up with his new avatar that they just announced about two or three months ago. I read in the paper that they were trying it out on U.S. visitor people people who, you know, submit your whole life and then you can have a pass in and out. This avatar is intended to be used for the migrants, right? So we create this, you know, funneling. We cross, we, we closed off all the traditional crossing areas for a hundred years. We would talk to migrants who would tell us they cross through the same hole in the fence year after year and go up the cosechas, go up and the strawberry, the garlic and berries, blah, 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 and come back. And of course, people are human beings, so people stay, also people stay and create families and such, but we began to close all of them. Tucson, I mean, Nogales in Arizona was not the major crossing area. It was San Diego, San Isidro, and El Paso, and then spread out everywhere. And what we did was we closed off all those areas not to stop migration, you see, it's all based on a lie. It's a lie when they say we want to close the border, they're lying. Because the, the guys who control this country have always wanted an open border. Now though, since uh, the globalization, as a general term, and they don't need as many workers and they need to control, right? Because now they've picked up these means of production where they had to pay, you know, so much to um, even car makers, you know? The United uh, UAW was formed after blood, sweat, and tears, just like my father. My father was a union organizer, copper miners. 
And they fought, and, uh, you know, we lived through seven strikes, and they did uh, back east, too, and Midwest. They fought for decent, you know, $16 an hour job kind of thing, and you didn't have to have a, a college degree. <clears throat> All of that began to be closed down. Even the farm work stuff has, you know, you need less workers because the technological advances are great. And now that they've been able to pick up and create maquiladora nations, I mean, you can see what we're setting up. Anyway, so we closed up all the borders and funneled them through Arizona purposely. Back in 94, we were telling people who didn't pay attention to us that this is what we were doing, that we were going to funnel people through Arizona for a purpose. We didn't want to close it. I mean, everybody knew they were good. You couldn't go any time to, um, um, oh my God, I'm losing the name of... Um, the uh, pueblito right south of um, Sasabe. Um, oh my gosh! Altet? Altet. Yeah. That the New York Times, uh, I don't know, in the 90s called it the bottleneck of North America. So it's not, and we knew where people are crossing. We did not necessarily want to stop it, right? We needed to just tell the public, oh, we need to secure our borders. 